By the time 1998 wrapped up, Lauren Hill truly personified the definition of someone who had it all. Youth, beauty, a career in entertainment that couldn't be more on fire after creating number one albums as both a member of a hip hop group and as a solo artist, as well as a man she deeply loved who would make her a mother. But then it all fell apart. In this video, we're gonna get to the bottom of all the rumors and speculation to find out what really happened to Lauren Hill. Rapper, singer, songwriter, and record producer Lauren Noel Hill was born on May 26, 1975 in East Orange, New Jersey. I was born in East Orange. I lived in Newark for a brief time, um, moved to New York for a short period of time, and then moved to South Orange. And uh, South Orange was, <clears throat> it was interesting because it was this um, very, diverse. She was raised by her mother, a high school English teacher, and father, a computer programmer and consultant, along with an older brother. Music was always front and center in the Hill home. My parents had a love for music. They had a love for, um, there, was, there was so many records, you know, so much music constantly being played. My mother played piano, my father uh, sang, and, and it was just music, always surrounded in music. I remember one of, one of my earliest memories was in a house in East Orange that we lived in where it's, you know, either Sundays or Saturdays, maybe Saturdays, we would clean the house and my mother would play, you know, uh, Stevie Wonder's uh, Songs in the Key of Life, the whole album. I just remember hearing Isn't She Lovely and, you know, and pretending to iron, you know. So from a very young age, there was a lot of music. Little did she know, Lauren would come face to face with the harsh judgments of the professional music industry also at a very young age. In 1988, the 13-year-old took to the Apollo Theater stage for an experience she would never forget. As her voice shook with nerves, her rendition of the miracles Who's Loving You was met with boos from the audience. I treated you While the reception didn't stop her from completing the performance, after she was done, she did cry backstage. Lauren then went on to attend Columbia High School. Friends and former teachers recall her as an overachiever who could effortlessly juggle advanced placement biology, violin lessons, and dance class. She also founded the school's gospel choir and led the cheerleading team. In her early teens, she met Procasrel Praz Michelle. He asked her to join the music group he was creating, consisting of himself and another female vocalist. That other young lady didn't last very long though, and was soon replaced by Praz's cousin, Wyclef Jean. The group began performing in local showcases and talent shows under a few different names. Even though Lauren was initially only a singer, she soon learned to rap too. Lauren began acting in her teens as well, landing a variety of roles, including one in 1991 on TV soap opera As the World Turns, as well as the role of Rita in the 1993 film Sister Act Two, Back in the Habit, which received critical acclaim. You know, I, I didn't have that uh, intense ambition to be a musician or an actress. You know, I just enjoyed it, you know, and if there was an opportunity, hey, you know, I'll go. And by enjoying it, because I loved it, it, it enabled me to, to get better at what I was doing, you know what I mean? Because there was a love behind it. It wasn't like, I've got to do this. You know, there wasn't just, you know, naked ambition. It, yeah, I really enjoyed what I was doing. Praz, Lauren, and Wyclef eventually settled on a permanent name for their group, Fugees, a derivative of the word refugee, a word often used derogatorily to refer to Haitian Americans. Both Praz and Wyclef share that background. The Fugees signed a contract with Rough House Records in a joint venture with Columbia in 1993. The same year Lauren, who would go on to be frequently referred to by the nickname El Boogie, graduated high school. Their debut album, Blunted on Reality, dropped the following year. While three singles were released, the album only reached number 62 on the Billboard Top R&B Hip Hop Albums chart and sold very poorly. They got far better results with their second effort, the score released two years later. It peaked at number one on the Billboard 200 and stayed in the top 10 of that chart for over six months. It sold 7 million copies in the US and more than 20 million worldwide. Singles from the project include Fuji Law, Ready or Not, the Bob Marley cover, No Woman, No Cry, and their breakout hit, another cover of the Lori Lieberman song, Killing Me Softly. 
The score won the Grammy Award for Best Rap Album, and Killing Me Softly won for Best R&B Performance by a duo or group with vocals. Surprisingly, during this period, 21-year-old Lauren was still living at home with her parents. She'd been enrolled at Columbia University, but ultimately left after about a year of total studies, once sales of the score skyrocketed. She also had to deal with a terrible rumor that could have, in today's time, cancelled her. In 1996, she went on The Howard Stern Show to respond to a report that she'd said she didn't want white people buying her music. So I was raving about your record and everything, you know? Uh -huh. And then um, this guy calls up and he goes, Hey, Howard, man, I'm a disc jockey. And I'm telling you, I saw Lauren on MTV. MTV. Okay. And she was screaming about how she would hope, this was the quote he said, that no white people would ever buy her record. <laughs> I think the quote was, she would rather starve. Yeah, starve. She would rather have her family, her children starve, than, than uh, have white people buy her record. Now, so then I got all bummed out, and I was like, oh, man, Come why does it have to get racial? What's that Come all? On. Isn't that sound retarded? I mean, it does. Did you say and that? We had a lot no. of people calling saying No, that. I totally, I mean, I think that it was probably taken out of context. What I was saying is that I make my music for young black youth because I'm a young black youth myself. And there's you a are? message in my song. Yes. And that's for people who look and come from the same areas that I do. That doesn't mean that my music isn't universal. Then, right in the midst of all their phenomenal success, the Fugees split up to work on solo projects. Well, that was the reported reason. According to Wyclef, though, as detailed in his 2012 autobiography titled Purpose, the real reason was his tumultuous affair with Lauren. The pair began dating in the early days of the Fugees and continued their involvement even after Wyclef married designer Marie Claudinette. When Lauren got pregnant with her first child, she tried to convince Wyclef that he was the father, even though it really was Bob Marley's son, Rohan, whom Lauren had met in 1996. When Wyclef found out Lauren had lied to him about paternity of her child, things hit a breaking point. In that moment, something died between us. I was married and Lauren and I were having an affair but she led me to believe that the baby was mine, and I couldn't forgive that. She could no longer be my muse. Our love spell was broken. Not that they had the best relationship to begin with. Wyclef elaborated further in his book. It was like we were two outlaws in love. We had fights on planes, we had huge fights, and a few times when it went down, she started swinging at me right there in the seats. People would scatter. We never got arrested, but we came close a few times in Europe. In the summer of 1997, Rohan and Lauren's first child, Zion, was born. After the score's tremendous success, fans were clamoring for Lauren, especially, to go solo. Her debut and to date only studio album, The Miseducation of Lauren Hill, dropped in August 1998. The inspiration for it came directly from her own life experiences. The Miseducation of Lauren Hill is, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> at first it kind of throws people, you know what I mean, because they automatically think it's about me. Um, being miseducated, but miseducation is actually, it's like a, a metaphor for actually being re-educated, um, unlearning some bad things, you know what I mean, some things that I may have um, perceived to be the truth, you know what I mean, that actually weren't. Um, it really has a lot to do with personal evolution and personal growth, and really understanding that there are things that society teach us, which are like general pieces of information, you know, just for the general public, and there are things that are extremely important for us to individually learn, you know what I'm saying? Um, just as far as just personal relationships, personal relationships with other people, personal relationships with God, you know. Several songs on the album concerned her frustration with the Fugees. I Used to Love Him dealt with the breakdown of the relationship between her and Wyclef. Other songs, such as To Zion, spoke about her decision to have her first baby, even though many at the time encouraged her to terminate, so to not interfere with her blossoming career. I always say that Zion had the most to do about my miseducation because it was like he he revived me, you know what I mean? He he it's like God sent him to revive my spirit. It was not only it was like the most humbling thing, but I had never been in love like that before. You know what I'm saying? It gave me this just this renewed spirit about about life and love and, and everything. Um, and there were a lot of people who were very um, skeptical and discouraging just because I was young and you know I mean my career was thriving at the time and um, I had been one of those people up until that point who would make a lot of decisions for other people you know who would put people other people's feelings before my own and Zion having Zion was really one of the 
the first decisions that I made which made me happy. The album launched atop the 200 album chart with first week sales of nearly 423,000 copies, the most for any female artist at the time. The lead single, doo That Thing, debuted at number one on the Billboard Hot 100. That thing, that thing, that thing. The second and third singles, X Factor and Everything Is Everything, respectively, also became top 40 pop hits. Just three months after her album dropped, Lauren's family grew by one more when she and Rohan welcomed their second child, a girl named Sayla. In the run-up to the 1999 Grammy Awards, Lauren became the first woman to be nominated in 10 categories in a single year. In addition to Miss Education works, the nominations included her rendition of Can't Take My Eyes Off You for the 1997 film Conspiracy Theory, and her writing and producing of A Rose is Still a Rose, which became a hit for Aretha Franklin. During the ceremony, Lauren broke another record by becoming the first woman to win five times in one night, taking home the awards for Best R&B Album, Best R&B Song, Best Female R&B Vocal Performance, Best New Artist, and Album of the Year, the first rapper to do so. She also made People Magazine's 50 Most Beautiful People list, was the first rapper to grace the cover of Time Magazine, and at just 23 years old, became the youngest woman ever to be included in Ebony Magazine's prestigious list of 100 plus most influential Black Americans. Lauren had made it as a solo artist in the biggest way possible. That fact, however, wouldn't protect her from everything. In late 1998, a 50-page lawsuit was filed by four musicians collectively known as Newark Entertainment against Lauren, her management, and record label, claiming that she used their songs and production skills but failed to properly credit them for the work on her debut album. She claimed Newark was trying to take advantage of her popularity. Then, in June of the next year, she received an Essence Award, but her acceptance speech, where she said there was no contradiction in religious love and servitude, drew a negative reaction from those in the public, who thought she wasn't a good role model as a young, unwed mother of two. Things were on the upswing again in 2000, when Lauren was one of the producers to share the Grammy Award for Album of the Year, awarded for Santana's 1999 multi-million selling Supernatural, since she'd written, produced, and rapped on the track, Do You Like The Way? She was also nominated for Best R&B Song, For All That I Can Say, which she'd written and produced for Mary J. Blige for her 1999 album, Mary. Her own duet with Bob Marley on Turn Your Lights Down Low for the 1999 remix tribute album, Chant Down Babylon, additionally appeared in the film The Best Man that same year and later received a Grammy nomination for Best Pop Collaboration with Vocals. In early 2001, the Newark suit was settled out of court, with Lauren paying them a reported $5 million. Her life drastically changed after this event. She began to trust people less and also sought a closer connection with her spirituality. Many of her friends and collaborators point to one specific relationship which had been especially destructive since her 90s heyday, a relationship which came into being just as Lauren was at her most vulnerable, feeling the pressures of both public life and the demands of supporting a family as a working mother. That person was a man who called himself Brother Anthony, a figure who many have described as a cult leader. He was believed to have convinced Lauren to sever ties with her management, colleagues, and friends, damaging her career in the years following their initial meeting. She later described this period of her life at length in a 2009 interview to Essence, saying, People need to understand that the Lauren Hill they were exposed to in the beginning was all that was allowed in that arena at that time. I had to step away when I realized that for the sake of the machine, I was being way too compromised. I felt uncomfortable about having to smile in everyone's face when I really didn't like them or even know them well enough to like them. She also spoke about her emotional crisis saying, for two or three years, I was away from all social interaction. It was a very introspective time because I had to confront my fears and master every demonic thought about inferiority, about insecurity, or the fear of being black young and gifted in this Western culture. In July 2001, while pregnant with her third child, Lauren unveiled her new material to a small crowd for a taping of an MTV Unplugged special. A live album of the concert titled MTV Unplugged Number 2.0 was released the following year. The project didn't receive anywhere near the praise that Miss Education did. Even with the mixed reviews and no significant radio airplay, the album still managed to debut at number three on the 200 chart 
and later achieve platinum status. Another plus? Her song, Mystery of Iniquity, from the album was nominated for a Grammy Award for Best Female Rap Solo Performance. Around 2001, Rohan and Lauren's third child, Joshua, was born. He was followed a year later by their fourth, John. While Lauren sometimes had spoken of Rohan as her husband, they never married. Maybe that had something to do with him already being married? You see, along the way, Lauren was informed that Rohan had been previously married at a young age. According to a 2003 Rolling Stone report, he'd never secured a divorce. He later disputed this and produced a 1996 divorce document to a blog. Lauren later revealed that she and Rohan have had long periods of separation over the years. Also around this time, Lauren was supposedly working on her sophomore album. Columbia reportedly coughed up $2.5 million to fund it, building a studio in her Miami apartment and purchasing flights and rooms for various artists to help with the album. However, the label allegedly pulled the plug financially as the artists that flew out spent most of their time in their hotels due to getting calls from Lauren's team that they would, quote, start tomorrow. The artists were eventually sent home and no album came out. Then she ticked off an entire religion. Lauren used a 2003 concert in Vatican City as an opportunity to read a letter criticizing the Catholic Church for its pedophilia scandal. In it, she said, I realize some of you may be offended by what I'm saying, but what do you say to the families who were betrayed by the people in whom they believed? Over the last two decades, Lauren has released music only sporadically. After several years apart, the Fugees reunited in 2004 to perform at Dave Chappelle's block party in Brooklyn. The group then made a surprise appearance the next year at the BET Awards, where they opened the show with a 12-minute set. After that, they were off on a European tour. It seemed that they were really getting back into the groove of things, but old tensions between Lauren and the other members of the group would soon resurface, and just as quickly as it started, the reunion ended. Wyclef and Praz both blame Lauren as the reason. By 2007, Lauren was doing solo shows that received mostly mixed reviews for several reasons, such as performing strange renditions of her songs, wearing weird attire, and probably what her fans lamented about the most, her lateness. Lauren had created quite a reputation for not just being late, but actually hours late. She addressed her tardiness issue in a 2016 Facebook post. I don't show up late to shows because I don't care, and I have nothing but love and respect for my fans. The challenge is aligning my energy with the time, taking something that isn't easily classified or contained and trying to make it available for others. I don't have an on-off switch. I am at my best when I am open, rested, sensitive, and liberated to express myself as truthfully as possible. For every performance that I've arrived too late, there have been countless others where I've performed in excess of two hours, beyond what I'm contracted to do, pouring everything out on the stage. A what's considered a rare find and unofficial type album titled Miss Hill, which featured cuts from Miss Education, various soundtrack contributions, and other unreleased songs, was released in 2007. The title was apparently the perfect choice since, in recent time, Lauren had been adamant about being referred to as Miss Hill instead of her first name. She would confirm as much to Essence a couple of years later. I've always been wise beyond my years. I've always been a teacher. When I was a child, I was teaching adults because I was always learning. I'm Miss Hill because I know I'm a wise woman. That is the respect I deserve. In early 2008, Rohan and Lauren's fifth child, Sarah, was born. The couple were not living together as Lauren was reportedly living with her mother and children in her hometown of South Orange, New Jersey. Sometime in 2010, many of the songs that Lauren had performed and recorded over the past several years were included on an unofficial compilation album titled Kulami Phase. It also features a range of other material found on the Miss Hill compilation. In the summer of 2011, Lauren gave birth to her sixth and to date last child, Micah. This one though was not with Rohan Marley. The father of this child remains publicly unknown. In June 2012, Lauren was charged with three counts of tax fraud or failing to file taxes on $1.8 million of income earned between 2005 and 2007. During this time, she'd toured as a musical artist, earned royalties from both her records and from films that she'd appeared in, and had owned and been in charge of multiple corporations. 
In a long post to her Tumblr, she said that she had gone underground and had rejected pop culture's climate of hostility, false entitlement, manipulation, racial prejudice, sexism, and ageism. She added, when I was working consistently without being affected by the interferences mentioned above, I filed and paid my taxes. This only stopped when it was necessary to withdraw from society in order to guarantee the safety and well-being of myself and my family. She appeared in the United States District Court for the District of New Jersey and Newark and pleaded guilty to the charges. Her attorney said she would make restitution for the back taxes she owed. By April of the following year, though, she paid back only a small fraction of what she owed. She faced possible eviction from her rented home in South Orange, as well as a civil lawsuit from the town for running a business out of a home without a zoning permit. The following month, Lauren was sentenced to serve three months in prison and three months house arrest afterwards as part of a year of supervised probation. She'd faced a possible sentence of as long as 36 months and the sentence given took into account her lack of a prior criminal record and her six minor aid children. By this point, she had fully paid back nearly $1 million in back taxes and penalties she owed, which also took into account an additional $500,000 that she had in unreported income for 2008 and 2009. Lauren reported to a minimum security facility that July to begin serving her sentence. She was released from prison that October, a few days early for good behavior, and began her home confinement and probationary periods. In 2018, she was back, center stage, as she embarked on the Miseducation of Lauren Hill 20th Anniversary World Tour. Lauren has won numerous accolades throughout her career, including eight Grammy Awards, six MTV Video Music Awards, four NAACP Image Awards, four Guinness World Records, and three American Music Awards. Along with having a successful music career, she's also achieved success as a songwriter and producer for other artists. In 2015, she received the Golden Note Award from the American Society of Composers, Authors, and Publishers, or ASCAP. Rolling Stone listed her debut album at the number 10 spot on their 500 Greatest Albums of All Time list in 2020. In 2021, the miseducation of Lauryn Hill was certified diamond, making Lauryn the first female hip hop artist to ever receive a diamond certification in the United States. That same year, Rolling Stone placed her single, Do Up That Thing, and the Fuji's version of Killing Me Softly on their revised list of the 500 greatest songs. Also in 2021, Lauryn popped up on an episode of Rolling Stone's 500 Greatest Albums podcast on Amazon Music. During the interview, she finally revealed the real reason why she never released another studio album after her debut. The wild thing is no one from my label has ever called me and asked how can we help you make another album? Ever. Ever. Did I say ever? Ever. With the miseducation, there was no precedent. I was for the most part free to explore, experiment, and express. After the miseducation, there were scores of tentacle obstructionists, politics, repressing agendas, unrealistic expectations, and saboteurs everywhere. People had included me in their own narratives of their successes as it pertained to my album, and if this contradicted my experience, I was considered an enemy. Lauren's name was back in the headlines again in 2023 after announcing her 25th anniversary tour to celebrate the miseducation of Lauren Hill. During a Los Angeles stop on her tour on November 4th, though, Lauren decided to use the moment to address the long-standing criticism that she's never on time for her performances. Oh, and if you're wondering, yes, she was late that night, too. She's late. She's late a lot. Yo, y'all gonna be out making on this blood rise stage every night. Okay. Going okay. Okay. On the stage. Okay. 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 Today, Lauren has developed a reputation on social media that sharply contrasts how she was celebrated in the 90s. She's become known as an artist whose self-interest is more important than anything else. The jokes and memes that people have made about her tardiness and being a diva have only fueled this image of herself. Some, however, still stand by Lauren and have no problem waiting to see the artist at work, given how rarely she performs or releases music. In her 2016 Facebook post, she even stated that though she shows up late, there are fans who wait even longer to meet her after the show. Things have seemingly gone well on this current tour, 
Besides her lateness, she's been delivering a quality show, and even tapped Wyclef and Praz to join her to celebrate the legacy of the Fugees on select dates. Unfortunately, as of November 22, 2023, Lauren was forced to halt the tour after suffering from the nightly use of a numbing steroid to aid her vocal cord injuries. She took to Instagram to reveal she was taking prednisone for her vocal strain. Although the medicine aims to help, it is more so a temporary fix that can have long-lasting effects. So in order to avoid further complications, she said she decided to postpone the remainder of the tour. Lauren went on to ensure that the canceled dates would be rescheduled for early 2024.